Hi everyone, welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is an open Q&A session to talk about episode six, the finale of Game of Thrones. As always, uh, the way that I'm gonna be running these, I've got some questions from my patrons. Uh, they're gonna form this kind of the backbone of what we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna pick up as many questions as I possibly can from the chat. Uh, obviously, if there's any super chats, I'll get to them as soon as I possibly can. Uh, we'll probably move around a little bit as well as talking about uh, the finale. I think that I've got a few questions about the differences potentially between the show and the books and a few other things, talking slightly more broadly as well. So we'll get to all of that when we can. Um, but let's start off with um, a couple of questions from um, my patrons. Uh, and we'll go straight in talking about episode six um the finale and ali al muhana said where might drogon have gone ashai or valyria perhaps so uh, uh, we saw drogon fly off with danny and we heard that they were flying off last seen in the direction of volantis now we don't know is the short answer we don't know where they went uh, but if you draw a line from King's Landing towards Volantis and just sort of keep it going for a little bit, then you get to Valeria, old Valeria. And given that Drogon, we've already seen him be there uh, a few seasons ago when um, Tyrion and Jorah were going through there, then they saw him flying overhead. Uh, and given that that's probably the closest there is to a spiritual home for the dragons, then it makes sense to me that that is where uh, they've gone, so uh, or where Drogon has gone. So we don't know, but my best guess is probably Valyria. Then also had uh, a couple of questions, in fact, three questions all on the same issue. Leathery Wings says, uh, I am confused by Drogon's actions after John killed Danny. I understand why Drogon was upset, upset but I do not understand why he did not burn John. Um, and Wonderdog26 Art Girl says, I did not understand why Drogon did not kill John and instead turned his anger and pain on the throne. Are dragons really that smart? And Dracaris Noir said, I'd like to echo others' confusion about this. Uh, Drogon apparently has enough emotional intelligence to recognize that the quest for the throne was Danny's downfall, but not enough to recognize that he was essential to killing and destroying everything. Um, so, the, these are all questions about why Drogon did what Drogon did after Danny died. So, I th if you saw my video on my breakdown video on episode six, you will see that this is for me. This was the one thing that I think we do really need an explanation from the showrunners. So I don't think they made this clear at all. They clear that they they showed us that Drogon smelt John, knew who John was. Drogon presumably would have managed to figure out that John did the killing. Um, my only best guess, I don't think it really works, but it's my only best guess is that Drogon could sense that John was also mourning and weeping and therefore didn't want to take out his anger. Uh, now, the uh, on him, that that feels a little weak to me. I'm very open to other ideas of, of something better. I do not buy into this idea that Drogon had some kind of weird uh, emotional intelligence that allowed him to conceptually understand that it was the quest for the throne which was the problem really rather than John. That doesn't work for me. Drogon just like breathed fire around the area to start with him just like letting out anger was what it looked like to me and then focused in on the Iron Throne because that was the focus of the room. I would probably say that the Iron Throne burning was as much a, well, if she can't have it, no one can kind of thing. So that's where I'm at on it. But I think we do need to have an answer from the showrunners. I don't think there is an obvious answer why Drogon didn't kill Jon, because uh, dragons do kill other Valyrians. It's not that he was trying to save a Valyrian or anything like that. Um, I think we there is a clear bit of a gap there that we do need a little bit extra on. Um, had a couple of uh, super chats that uh, let's get to uh, straight away. Uh, had a couple actually before we went uh, on air. 
Um, firstly, uh, from Ricardo Guira saying, do you think George R. R. Martin has enough room in two books to successfully conclude this series, given all the dangling threads? Um, it's a good question. I think two big books, perhaps. Um, he's talked about having 1500 manuscript pages for each of those last two books. Now, uh, exactly what a manuscript page is, you can get lots of different interpretations, but that's basically at the limit of what a book could be um, in terms of just simple binding. So it would not surprise me if one or both of these last two books are actually split into two in terms of sales and all the rest of it, released at the same time probably, but split into two. So um, yeah, I think he probably will finish in the two that he said he was going to do, but um, I think they will be long, um, very long. Uh, he has got a lot of plots going and uh, he's reached the point where the story has expanded out so far and he's not yet brought it back in again. So what will happen, I think, in uh, The Winds of Winter is that he's going to start having expanded the story out. He's now going to have to start bringing it back in. We saw that on the show. The characters started coming back together again. Uh, when the, the Essos bit of the story can be largely put to bed, that will happen in the Winds of Winter and the action will move back to Westeros. So uh, it's entirely doable, uh, but for those who didn't catch, he's got a not a blog, which is his website, his blog, and occasionally he gives little updates on what's going on. Uh, for those who were wanting an update on where the books are at, he has confirmed two things. Firstly, he has not finished Winds of Winter. I think we knew this already, but he confirmed it. And secondly, he has not started A Dream of Spring. So any thoughts that perhaps he's going to release both of them at the same time? No, he's going to do The Winds of Winter first. He's going to get that one out of the way. And then he's going to be moving on to A Dream of Spring after that. But he is uh, now talking about effectively getting it done within the next year. He wants to go to Worldcon Big uh, convention in New Zealand next summer with it in his hand is what he's saying. He's, he's aimed for these kinds of things before so we should probably take this with a, a bit of a pinch of salt but uh, I think we're we're clearly nearer the end of his writing of The Winds of Winter than we are at the beginning so uh, I'm still feeling hopeful. Um, Maura Lee, uh, thank you so much, very generous super chat. Uh, saying, thank you, Robert, for all the past live streams regarding both the show and the Song of Ice and Fire book series. Looking forward to the documentary. Yeah, there's, uh, for those who don't know, at the same time that Game of Thrones, the series, the show was on, this week, this Sunday, there's going to be a documentary, uh, an official documentary made by HBO, uh, which has got all, lots of the old cast are coming back for it. And it's effectively, it's like the, the official making of and celebration of Game of Thrones. So I think it will be worth a watch um, looking back over all eight seasons, not just looking at the last uh, season or so. Um, and more of the Traveller's Guide series uh, and more of the Time Machine on my second channel. Uh, thank you. Good. Uh, Gives me a chance to say so the traveler's guide for those who don't know i do the traveler's guide to westeros which is um basically it's me exploring the regions of westeros of this world that george R. R. martin has had uh, and i do videos uh just trying to get in the feel of a place not just give the history of a place but actually what does it look like what does it what does it smell like just trying to actually get into it um and that will be coming back i was hoping to start it for this friday but realistically it's going to be next friday we're going to start up with the traveler's guide to bravos uh, which is something i've been really looking forward to so that's going to happen and the well-told tale my second channel is an audio narration channel um and we're currently reading through the time machine uh, i've got slightly behind on that due to uh focusing on game of thrones to be honest but we will be picking up on that with the time machine uh, as soon as possible, uh, definitely by next Wednesday. Uh, but so thank you, Maura. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Jack Hurst uh, saying uh, hashtag chaos is a ramp. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, obviously a brand reference. Um, Mulham uh, Al Hazmi, thank you so much for those two uh, super chats. I didn't see a question on either of those. 
Um, but uh, what I'll do, as always, I will just actually I'll just set it up now. I forgot to do it earlier. Is uh, I have a, an open channel of communication with my moderators. Thank you, moderators, uh, as always, doing a fantastic job uh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, if if they see a question, I'm sure they'll be able to uh, pass it on to me. Uh, Lucas Giorgio says the Tully, Stark, and Weirwood references in Sansa's dress was beautiful. What do you think the symbolism of Sansa's hair being fully down means? Um, well, I'm not really a hair expert uh, or a dress expert, but what I would say is I loved the dress. They had it uh, for fully 10 seconds, uh, and I thought it was amazing. Uh, costume CO, uh, great channel if you're interested in costumes. Uh, uh, Heidi does some fantastic stuff. She's come on here a couple of times to talk about the costumes. Uh, her reaction, I saw it on Twitter, was to say the best, the best dress, best costume of the entire season, uh, and they just gave it 10 seconds. Bit of a waste, but I thought it was fantastic. The only thing I would say about Sansa's hair is that throughout the, uh, the the show, pretty much from season one onwards, uh, Sansa has tended to do her hair uh, in a way that is reflective of a character that's close to her or she respects in some way or she's trying to impress in some way. She did it like Cersei. She did it like Daenerys. Um, having it just down and straight for me, perhaps, is just a symbol that she is now herself. She's no longer just trying to please somebody else or impress somebody else or anything like that. It's just her finally reaching that position where she she can just be her, not anybody else. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that's my my best guess in terms of um, uh, Sansa's hair. Um, uh, the Chinster, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, uh, would we all feel differently about the TV show if the books were already finished and we knew where the story was heading before the series began? Yeah, I think you may well be right on this one to an extent. I think that uh, some of the uh, disappointment with season eight, not all of it, uh, but some of it was uh, from the fact that people had decided they knew how it was going to end, and then it didn't end like that, and uh, that led to a bit of disappointment. I say some of it because there are also some very legitimate uh, concerns, shall we say, with uh, the writing of the show, uh, continuity and things like that. So, uh, yes, I think if we had an ending and we knew it was going to get do that, then there wouldn't be the, uh, the, the sort of the emotional reaction to a lot of what happened. Uh, there was a lot of the, well, there were a lot of people going through effectively through shock. I think is my interpretation of it. When things like episode three and episode five happened, because we didn't know that was going to happen, and so it actually it took us aback because we weren't expecting it. And that that was deliberate on the part of the showrunners. They deliberately wanted to surprise us with stuff, and they succeeded in that. Uh, whether or not you think that they. They, those were good surprises is a completely different matter. But yes, if we already knew what was going to happen, it would have had a very different impact. Uh, I, I think you're very uh, right about that. Uh, Sabet Weight Loss says, I don't have a question. Thanks for the great content. Thank you very much. Um, Bridget Walsh says, I am starting to feel better about Bran being king, seeing this through an anti-war perspective. But I still really thought we would see a pregnant Danny. Yeah, so uh, I've got lots of questions about Bran being king coming up, so I'll pick up on that bit in a moment. In terms of pregnant Daenerys, yeah, they kind of built it up uh, last season, season seven, and didn't really pay it off. So I, I agree and sympathise to an extent. I think it would have added something to the, the tragedy of what happened if she were pregnant when Jon killed her. Um, uh, whether or not he knew it, I think that that would have added, I mean, whether we needed more heartbreak, I don't know, but that would certainly have added something into the mix. Uh, so, yeah, I think there was, there was a missed trick there, uh, but maybe she just wasn't pregnant. That's entirely possible. All of the uh, the sort of the foreshadowing things that we took for, this is foreshadowing of her being pregnant in season eight, 
could just as easily have been this is warming up to the fact that Danny's children are the dragons. And so when she loses the dragons, it's like her losing children. Uh, and they did uh, a little bit try and mirror what happened with Cersei losing her children with what happened with Daenerys and losing her children. So, so it's possible looking back that that's what they were trying to do rather than uh, uh, create a position where we were expecting uh, Danny to be pregnant. Um, Jack Hurst saying, looking forward to your and Gemma's series continuing. Uh, thank you. Uh, so for those who don't know, I, this is a reference to, uh, as, uh, well, it was a sort of an ad hoc series that I was, a series of videos that I was doing with Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel, a uh, fine channel, by the way, do go and check her out. Uh, and that is, uh, it, we were looking at, um, well, we struggled for a name for this uh, because the, the the more accurate name was something like uh, cool minor houses that we think have probably got something important to do in the later books. Um, and then we just looked at them uh, in turn, House Reed, House Dane, uh, House Hightower. So we've got another couple we're going to be doing. I think we're going to do House Martell, obviously quite a major house, and also House Manderley. Um, so, yeah, I will talk to Gemma and we'll see whether we can get those uh, um, coming at some point in the next couple of weeks. Also, the showrunners confirmed Drogon saw the sword in Danny and thought the throne stabbed her. Okay. Um, I don't think I've got much to say to that. Um, that doesn't work for me. Let's put it. Let's put it that way. Um, Dornish Dan, uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Danny's today's today King's Landing, tomorrow the world and Nuremberg like speech show her real world fanaticism rather than insanity. Will George R R Martin add anti totalitarian to anti war themes in the books? Yeah, he might do. Um, I think there's a um, in the books, Danny, in the last chapter in particular that we've got, and shouldn't read too much into just one chapter, but she, the, the, the kind of the plot or the thread that she was going through in uh, A Dance with Dragons was that she was in Marine and trying to rule Marine and not really thinking about going over and invading Westeros. Um, and, uh, but then she goes off, Drogon flies off with her into the Blackie Sea, and that's the point where she starts getting more uh, Targaryen-y, uh, getting more thoughts about uh, uh, fire and blood, and you get Quaith, who in the books is this kind of continual presence just in Danny's mind, saying to her, remember who you are, the dragons remember, uh, you know, you're a Targaryen. And so she's going to, it seems in the books, she's going to become more fire and blood. Uh, so that seems to be the trajectory she's been going on. And I think that um, we will be um, presented with a character. This is the way that George R. R. Martin does, and he doesn't spoon feed us stuff, but he's going to present us with a character who we had previously been broadly on the side of, doing things that we might disagree with and left to draw our own conclusions from it. Um, the the totalitarian thing effectively is what um, absolute monarchy is. That's what Danny has been saying that she's wanting. That's what the Targaryen regime always was because they were they were absolutely in control of everything. Ultimately, the king or queen decided on what happened, and that we call it twentieth twenty first century would call that totalitarianism in the olden days. That was just um, the divine right of kings or something along those uh, lines. Um, Chris Stanley said, I'm still wondering, this kind of links across to what I was just saying, who was Quaith? So frustrated they never answered that. So Quaith um, is one of a number of things which happened in the first couple of seasons of the show that were in the books and they included in the show because they were trying to sort of map across largely one for one to start with. Um, but then they realized that actually they weren't going to follow that plot line. So in the show, Quaith just gets like one random appearance and then disappears. Uh, in the books, 
she has uh, this ongoing role uh, as as effectively a guide for Danny, geeing her on to be more Targaryen. So that's what's going on with Quaithe in the books, and we will, I'm sure, discover more about her there. In the show, it's just one of those little threads that they started to pick up and then thought, actually, you know what, we're not going to follow that. We've not got the time. So they went a completely different way. Um, and Nonya Nelson, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, similarly, uh, Mark Philipposian uh, didn't uh, spot questions with either of those, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, let's go back to a couple of questions from my patrons. Um, Susan Dunkel says, poor John, please just lie to me and tell me that the look on John's face after the closing of the Castle Black Gate was the long overdue awareness that he was free. I feel terrible about his ending. Um, yeah, my, I don't actually feel terrible about his ending. I quite like his ending. Um, so the way that this is, or the reason why I quite like his ending is that he, it sort of echoes the Frodo ending in Lord of the Rings in that Frodo was the protagonist in the Lord of the Rings. He was worn down by the weight of the world and he couldn't, after everything he'd been through, he could not enjoy the, the fruits of what he'd achieved. Uh, and he wasn't, he didn't have a place in the world anymore. John has that same kind of vibe about him. He cannot appreciate and enjoy what's going on in the world anymore, the things that he's seen and done. Um, and Frodo headed off to the west. John's headed up to the north. Um, and I think they've got that same kind of vibe going on there that it's just the, the new world is not for them. The world that they helped save, if you like, was not for them. Now, I look back couple of episodes to, I think it was episode four, when you saw John and Tormund and the wildlings celebrating the victory over the Night King. And the smile on John's face then, for me, that was the happiest I've ever seen him. It was, he seemed free in that moment. These were his people. And so when he goes north, that's what he's doing. He's going back to, really, to his people. And heading up there, um, is not, and then this is where you say, please lie to me and say that this is the long overdue awareness that he was free. I, I don't think it's a lie. I think that's what it was. The, the whole idea was that he was now going forward. He'd reconnected with Ghost. He'd reconnected with the people. As Tormund says, he's got the true north in him. This is actually where he belongs uh, and he is free. So I, I think that is my taken it i was quite happy with john's uh, ending um uh, tony 3483 saying he's going to meet val and abandon the night's watch uh that's a show reference um yeah val was not a character that we had in the uh sorry that was a book reference val was not a character we had uh, really in the show um wonder dog 26 art girl says why was gray worm allowed to remain in control and have so much power where John would go. So the situation was that after John killed Danny, um, the Drogon had gone off. The biggest army in control of King's Landing was the Unsullied and the Dothraki. So that, that, that was the army in control at the time. They had Tyrion in prison. John was there and they imprisoned John, so they had control of the city. So that is why Grey Worm's in a position of power. Yes, I'm sure that the others, the other uh, bits of the Seven Kingdoms could have sort of pulled together an army that uh, could have defeated them, but the point was that Grey Worm was in control, therefore he got a voice in what was going on. Um, wasn't a matter of allowing him to remain in control. He had control of the city, and that's why he um, uh, got to negotiate about the outcome of different things. Uh, Amy says, uh, Arya's white horse, question mark. Uh, so Arya, this is a an episode five question, I assume. This is, 
if you remember at the end of episode five, Aya just sees that after, after all the devastation, Aya sees a, a, a white horse that's kind of uh, bloodied and dirty, and she just like shushes it, climbs on the back, and then rides away. Now, I think this was just a symbolic horse. They they wanted a little way to end the episode uh, that that felt quite. Um, uh, sort of freeing uh, people escaping from this. Aya in that episode, it was her symbolically uh, giving up on her her kill list. This is what happened with the Hound, with Sandor, and he basically said, you don't want to turn into me, and if you carry on following that path that you are at the moment, you're going to turn into me. And she turned around and didn't confront Cersei, which is what she would have to do if she was trying to finish off her kill list. And so that her then action then was to try and save lives rather than take lives. And so uh, the, the white horse was symbolic of her finding that freedom from a life of um, just vengeance and death. Uh, and it was it was a white horse which was bloodied and it was smudged and like she was if you remember what she looked like in that episode and so that's what the uh, overall um, uh, feel was and it was a sense of freedom at least I think that's what they were trying to do I don't think it was anything else that the horse didn't really have any other role there other than to get her out and be symbolic basically. Um, let's go back to uh, a couple of uh, super chats. Um, uh, G. Joe, thank you so much, uh, says during Aegon's conquest, the king in the north bent the knee and the north joined the seven kingdoms. Uh, in episode six, Aegon slash John bent the knee. Stark became the king and the North was independent again. Did they do that on purpose? Um, probably, yes. What they definitely were trying to do was to show the, um, the fact that Danny is a sort of an echo of Aegon the Conqueror. So Aegon the Conqueror brought in Targaryen rule. He was the first Targaryen king. He invaded the dragons. Uh, the, the dragon he rode was Balerion the Black Dread. Uh, Drogon is an echo of Balerion the Black Dread. The Iron Throne, we were reminded of it at the time, was forged in the fire of Balerion the Black Dread. And Drogon, Drogon's fires were what destroyed the Iron Throne. So we're being told to, or being shown, that... The Targaryen rule in Westeros was bookended by Aegon the Conqueror and Danny, and so, uh, uh, as you rightly say, the, the the King of Winter or the King of the North uh, bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror, and at the end of it, uh, at the end of Targaryen rule, the North gained its independence again. I think that was that was deliberate. Um, the rest of the stuff, um, perhaps. Perhaps not so much. Um, uh, Alex Gurgen says, what's your opinion on why the writing suffered? Um, well, I mean, the obvious answer is that they ran out of the source material. Um, the, the, the slightly more nuanced answer is that they were, they were viewing this as a different thing. Initially, this was an adaptation of a book, so they would... Uh, try and stick as closely to the book as possible, but then they turned it into effectively a TV show inspired by the books because they didn't have the source material to go on, which meant that they were writing not in terms of a literary adaptation, but they were writing for a televisual event, which meant that they were trying to do things a lot more visually than they were in the first few seasons where they were trying to do things with a lot more conversations and politicking like that so and when it worked well things like the the burning of the great sept battle of bastards um the the knighting of brienne when it worked well it worked really well as a visual spectacle 
um, but it meant that the writing itself uh, wasn't the same as it was originally. So I think a number of different levels to this, I, and I, um, I think that we should accept the fact that George R. R. Martin is a once in a generation writer of fantasy fiction and we shouldn't expect other people to be able to write to his standards. It's, it's a shame, but that's, that's the truth of it, unfortunately. Uh, Amber Sabala uh, and Michael Creston, thank you so much uh, for the super chats. Again, didn't see a question attached to either of them, uh, but thank you. JCR6311 saying, I wish it had been 10 episodes and developed more. Anyway, I've enjoyed these streams very much. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the streams. Um, yeah, I think most people would agree with the um, wishing it had been 10 episodes rather than the six. Um, I, I had no problem with them doing longer episodes, but I, I think, and I'm not alone in thinking this, I'm sure, but the extra development would have worked a treat. Uh, the, there are two examples just off the top of my head that they, they rushed through, and that meant that the emotional impact of what happened was um, uh, completely diminished. So. John and Daenerys, when you actually try and figure out how much screen time did them being in some kind of loving relationship have, really it was just um, the, the, the boat scene at the end of season seven and then that scene of them flying the dragons at the beginning of season eight. Uh, they, they had less than an episode of screen time when they were a normal couple before Sam told John about his true parentage and then John uh, obviously went a little bit uh, brooding and not wanting to talk about it. So the fact that they didn't actually show us them being in a proper relationship meant that the, the, the breakdown of that relationship, which seems to happen over you know, the next five episodes, that didn't have as much emotional resonance or impact because we hadn't actually been brought into the relationship to start with. So, and they did that a few times. It's the same with Jamie and Brienne. They didn't really, when you think about actually how much it would have, they were together for a few weeks, it would appear. How, what did we see of them together? Not really that much. So you need to buy into characters and situations in order for, uh, when something happens to them for that to have an emotional payoff. And so I think that is um, uh, one of the ways that sort of the speeding things up didn't help at all. Uh, Nick uh, Kazimatis uh, saying, thank you for all your commentary. Thank you. Um, Susan Dunkel saying, thank you. I feel better now. That I assume is a response to the, the question about John going north. Uh, Chris uh, Torres saying uh, $20, thank you very much, saying thank you so much for doing these, you are very welcome. Let's go back to um, a couple of questions from my patrons. Bonds says, I really struggle to see how or where Bran being king was set up in the previous seasons and episodes. It really has left me feeling cheated. It's like an ending, uh, he woke up and it was all a dream. Um, so uh, you then say, could George R. R. Martin have given the showrunners the wrong ending so as not to spoil his books? Um, just on that last bit, no, I don't believe that's the case. I think that what happened was exactly what they said happened, is that they were working very closely together. And then George R. R. Martin realised that he, well, he took a step back from working on the show and he realised that he probably wasn't going to get the stuff finished uh, by the time that the show finished. And so they had uh, a few days together and George R. R. Martin told them in broad brushstrokes where the books were going to go. And they then went away and turned that into what we see. Now, they couldn't turn it exactly into what, we, we, uh, into what the books were going to be because they've changed so much or left out so much plot to the whole Fagon Aegon thing isn't isn't happening. Everything that's going on in Dawn isn't happening. The, there's literally hundreds of characters in the books that aren't on the show. Uh, so 
it won't be exactly the same, but they will have done broad brush strokes of what was going on in uh, in the show. So that is, I think, what happened. Um, uh, so going back to the first bit about the sort of uh, setup for brand being king, um, this is actually what my next video is going to be about was the why brand is king how how did that happen so um i will explain it fully in that video but i always spoil my next video in these live streams so i will give you the headlines from it uh, which are that brand it would appear well there's two elements to this brand it would appear set this up um, you can see his actions, All every single interaction he had in season eight seems to be with one of two aims. For the first to bring about the end of the Night King and the Army of the Dead, that was where the whole um, placing him in front of the Weirwood Tree um, uh, previously in season seven, giving Arya the cat's ball dagger, things like that. Those were all him setting things up for that. But then the other things he was doing seemed to be setting up what's happening now. The the scene, random scene, when uh, Tyrion says, tell me your story. Uh, and I speculated at the time that perhaps this was because Ra uh, that Tyrion was suddenly realised something that Bran knew and this was going to help in the fight against the Night King or something like that. That never happened. But it was important because the reason why Tyrion decided to suggest Bran as king, in his words, were because you need somebody with a good backstory, effectively. And we'd just been shown the fact that Bran had told him what his story was. So um, that was there. Similarly, um, we had a conversation between him and uh, Bran and Tyrion, where Bran's just sort of saying, I don't really want anything anymore. And we then got this other conversation between Varys and Tyrion when they're talking about how the person who's best to rule is the person who doesn't want to rule. So they kind of set it up, but you only saw it after the event. Um, that's the first half of it. The second half of it is that I think we need to not think about Bran as Bran. He was being very clear he is not Bran anymore. He is the three-eyed raven. He is the, cum the cumulative um memory life experience uh of westros effectively and the weirwood network so we sh it, this isn't bran making a power bid this is the weirwood network making a power bid so uh that is what has been going on and we have to then look back in time not just in this last season to try and work out what have they been doing to try and manipulate getting to this point because they can see the future and uh, so that's that's my general take on Bran, is that, yes, it seemed quite out of left field, but he did do the groundwork for this in season eight. And we shouldn't think of Bran as being Bran anymore. Bran is the Weirwood Network. Um, another question from... Um, my patrons, James Sidney says, does Grey Worm honestly uh, trust that justice will be done to John after after all the unsullied, unsullied were heading to Narth, uh, leaving no way to ensure enforcement? Um, so possibly, I, I think that um, the, the implication of what they were showing was that um, the unsullied left once they'd seen that John had been escorted out. Um, that seems to be the implication. Uh, but yeah, I mean, technically, if they wanted to play fast and loose with the unsullied, then they could just like uh, bring John back again afterwards. Um, I can only assume that they just thought, you know what, Grey Worm trusts that what's going to happen is going to happen. He, he uh, and, and left it at that. I, it's one of those bits of season eight where I think. Uh, it probably doesn't bear overthinking it. Um, they they reach an agreement. Uh, Grey Worm hung around long enough to see that they were enacting the agreement, and so there's no reason for him to doubt that they would go through with it after that either. That's, that's what I think was going on there. Um, Krishna Bhargav 
says, I have a question on Aya's quest beyond the Sunset Sea. Her ship may not necessarily be the Sun Chaser, but is she someone similar to uh, Alyssa Farman in any way? Or does she resemble King Brandon Stark, father of Brandon the Burner? So there's a couple of book characters uh, here. So Arya heading off west it was another thing that seems to come slightly out of left field in the finale. She had, when she was back in Bravos, she did uh, randomly ask that that actor that she was supposed to be killing, she did say, what's, what's west of Westeros? Um, but that was the only kind of hint uh, that she was even thinking about it. Um, the two characters that are mentioned there, Alyssa Farman is a character in uh, Fire and Blood. We read about quite a lot in Fire and Blood. She um, uh, she stole some dragon eggs, sold them. These, incidentally, almost certainly the dragon eggs that Danny ends up getting. Um, uh, but she sell sells the dragon eggs in order to buy a massive boat called the Sun Chaser and head off west to see what is there, because west of Westeros, it's a big mystery. People have got headed off and never returned, and no one knows what's there. So she goes off, and then there's a hint a little bit later in the book that perhaps she managed to get all the way around uh, the, the circumference and came up to a shy the other way around, rather than sort of heading east, but heading west. Um, so that's uh, Alyssa Farman. Um, King Brandon, the father of Brandon the Burner, um, he built a navy and set off, this was at some point in the past, he built a navy and set off west, looking to see what, what was beyond the Sunset Sea, and he never returned. And so his son being called Brandon the Burner is because his son was upset by this and then burnt all the shipyards. Um, and that's why the Starks have never really had a, a huge navy per se. Um, so uh, in terms of um, who is she being similar to, well, I, I think the, the showrunners were just taking inspiration from a couple of characters uh, in the books, um, not saying that she's exactly like them. I think that they just wanted to have a, a a nice ending for Aya where she could be looking forward, not backwards, uh, because her arc was that she gave up, as we were talking about a moment ago, she gave up on that life of vengeance. She didn't want to be a noble lady. She never wanted to be a noble lady. So what's left for her? Exploring the world. So that's they then took inspiration from uh, those book characters. I think that's what's been going on. Uh, Brandon the Shipwright, yes, um, uh, Girl Nettles, thank you very much. Um, and uh, a question from James Sidney. Um, are you surprised that more kin kingdoms didn't request or demand independence at the Great Council? Uh, Yara wanted independence in her alliance with Danny. Um, Dawn has a long history of independence. Um, the other regions currently have strong Stark ties, so it makes sense for them to stay. Um, but uh, I'm willing to wager that the books will show more autonomy for each realm and that the electric monarch will act as warden of Westeros. Um, so the, in terms of the question, am I surprised that other bits of Westeros didn't ask for their own independence? Um, yes, I guess. I mean, I, as a, as a great council, I wasn't particularly convinced by it. Uh, I, I didn't really work for me very well. Um, the fact that the Starks were so overrepresented uh, and none of the others seemed to think this was an issue at all, uh, that the way that everybody just meekly agreed to the first suggestion that was on the table, there was a lot there that didn't really work for me. Um, I think, yes, Yara probably should have asked for independence. Um, the Prince of Dawn, perhaps the Dornish didn't feel in a strong enough position. That This seems to have been a very new ruler, so perhaps they didn't feel in a strong enough position to ask for independence. Um, the other regions, it makes sense that they didn't. So um, I think I would agree that um, 
if a similar thing happens in the books, then the chances of the Seven Kingdoms kind of splitting apart a bit more is is reasonably high. The, the thing I said in my video is that although they set this up as being this is a big change, actually it's not a big change what happened. Uh, the kings had been elected by great council before, that's not a new thing. Um, yes, they got rid of the hereditary principle in terms of the actual king of uh, the seven or six kingdoms or whatever they wanted to call it. Um, but each of the, the the main lords still kept on being hereditary. So Sansa's children, if she has any, would presumably inherit uh, the uh, Winterfell in the north. The Prince of Dawn, if, if he had any children, they would presumably inherit. So actually, at a ground level, not much changed. All that changed is that instead of there being a presumption that the uh, the monarch's children take over from them, everybody just gathers together and decides who the new monarch is. And in reality, that happened really quite a lot anyway in the history of uh, the Targaryens. Uh, they very rarely, certainly in Fire and Blood Part 1, very rarely did the actual heir inherit. Um, it was whoever had the most power, which is exactly what happened in the... Uh, the Great Council, the Starks had the most power, so they got to decide who was the um, the, the king, effectively. Um, Shadow Fox says uh, that the Glovers refused to join the uh, battle for Winterfell. Why? Uh, it's a good question. I think it's... Um, I, I mean to try and show that not all of the North was on side with this, um, to try and so that they could come up with the, the line that if if anyone's not come, then they're now part of the army of the dead. I, th I think it's that rather than any particular geopolitical reason. The the Glovers, I guess, out of all the, the houses, probably felt that they could retreat back and the army of the dead might pass them by because deep would mot their home in order to get to it, then you've got to go all the way through uh, the, uh, the Wolfswood um, and right up to the coast. You really ha you only go there if you're going there, to be honest. So they may all have thought that they could get away with it. Um, no real explanation is given other than the fact that it probably quite rightly showed that not everybody was just coming in behind the Starks just because they're the Starks. Uh, Michael Mayflower, thank you so much for your uh, super chats. Um, uh, the um, I didn't see a question attached to that, uh, but uh, Michelle she sells um, <laughs> tongue twister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chrissy, for picking up on the question, saying if the showrunners decided the ending was not going to be influenced by George's plot points. Um, how would you've liked it to have ended? The books would have remained a surprise also. Um, I think, well, I mean, I, I think that they did decide that they were going to do it based on roughly what George R. R. Martin said. Um, and the, the re, and, and I think that's roughly what we saw but it's the big beats rather than the details that we need to be paying attention to. So I'll do a video on this as well uh, at some point in terms of what the big differences are likely to be in the books and the show. But the, the kinds of things that we've heard from George chime with the broad beats of what happened on the show. So, for example, he says he talks about the ending being... Uh, having the feel of the scouring of the Shire. So uh, you have the in the Lord of the Rings, which is yeah, after the big bad has been defeated, then you get um, uh, defeating the, the, the secondary bad guy. Um, uh, and uh, then you have a sort of a long, slow, drawn out, many endings kind of thing. Um, 
And he loved that and he wanted that to be reflective. And that was broadly what happened here. I think everybody was surprised that the Army of the Dead was dealt with halfway through the season, or certainly some people were surprised. But that chimes with what George R. R. Martin seemed to be saying. Similarly, the idea that the dragons uh, and Daenerys are not just going to be a force for good chimes with this idea that he's talked about a lot, which is ice and fire being these two opposing forces, both of which could destroy the world. Um, and he, he talked about uh, the fact that the people in Westeros are ignoring, this is obviously going back a little bit in the books where they are, ignoring the threats outside of Westeros. Um, not just the threat from the north of the wall, but the threats. So he obviously is Im imagining the dragons as being one of the threats. So um, it, it, the broad beats of what is there, I think, are, are what we, we were given. What has been changed is the details about exactly how it happened. So I don't think that the well, I think I've got a question on this later, but I don't think that the uh, the burning of King's Landing will necessarily happen exactly like that or exactly that order. I don't think the Jamie Cersei thing will happen exactly like that. I think that there's uh, things like um, one could imagine George R. R. Martin saying Jamie and Cersei uh, die uh, in each other's arms. Um, they enter the world together. They leave it together. That sounds entirely right and fair and reasonable in terms of a, an arc for both of them, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were going to be crushed by falling masonry in the books. If that makes sense, it may well happen in a very different way. Um, d -d -d JC Gonzalez says, can Three-Eyed Raven be evil? Blood Raven tells the Mad King, Bran tells Danny, burn them all. Do you think they can be leaving this for the prequel? Um, so the showrunners are not involved in the prequel. So I, I think whenever people ask whether or not the showrunners have left something for the prequel or they're trying to set something up for the prequel, I think the answer is no, they're not involved in it. That's a completely different thing. Um, the the Three-Eyed Raven being evil, I think that... Um, if you view it like you would view Blood Raven, Blood Raven believes that what he's doing all the way through his life before he became uh, the Three Eyed Crow, then he did what he did for the good of the realm as he saw it. And that meant sometimes he did bad stuff um, that you might not think is warrants what he's trying to do, but um, he sees the end as justifying the means. So I think that the Three-Eyed Raven, the Weirwood Network, are very much in that mold. So Bran, I think this is the biggest example, Bran knew about the burning of King's Landing ahead of time. Uh, he saw it in his vision. When he was downloading everything from the Weirwood Network, he was being drag dragged out of Blood Raven's cave, he saw the image of the shadow of the dragon flying over King's Landing, which we saw in episode five. So he saw Drogon, Daenerys on Drogon burning King's Landing, and he said nothing. He didn't, didn't tell anyone anything about this. And I think this is because he knew that the only way that Jon was ever going to turn on Danny was if Daenerys did that. And he saw that as just the way to make this happen. So I think, does that make him evil? Perhaps it does, uh, but he would not view it that way, or the Weirwood Network would not view it that way. As George R. R. Martin says, everyone's a hero in their own story. Uh, Valerie Morgulis says, no questions. Thank you and your moderators and chat participants. I've learned so much. Well, thank you. And, and yeah, guys, there's always so many excellent uh questions and answers in the chat. Uh, so uh, yeah, d thank you guys and moderators. I say every time I've got the best moderators in the world. So they, uh, the, the, the work that they did, particularly in the uh, pre-show streams when people were trying to get spoilers in there was amazing. Guys, thank you so much. 
Um, Coin HODL says, uh, Danny was a good show hero to me, and I was filled with nerd rage when they made her evil. Is she less of a hero in the books? Um, good question. So I think they've um, they've done quite a good job, or George R. Martin done quite a good job in the books of showing her many layers. She does. She genuinely cares about stuff. Uh, slavery is a is a thing that she's trying to abolish. She wants to be a good queen in Marine. Uh, so it's set up for her to have all of these positive things. and But at the same time, she still does have that tendency that in the uh, we see in the show where her first instinct is to burn people. And the hints are that that's where her arc is going to be going. So in both book and show, I think we're we're trying to be shown this character who is not just good or evil, but capable of both great good and evil, which means that we just have to try and move away from this um, concept of, of we just have good guys and bad guys. We have multi-layered characters. The, the fact that Danny has dragons makes her decisions much more important than other people's decisions so when she gets angry or whatever it makes a huge difference so so that is the that is the thing that is that she's multi-layered in both books and show some good things some bad things um but what she does with that has much more of an impact um have a quick mod mary thank you saying i feel like the last few seasons were book spoilers and now we know how it ends but without all of the wonderful writing and story development yeah th to a degree as i was saying what where where i see this is that they've shown us the broad brushes of this um i think so some things i think will definitely happen in the books like john killing daenerys i think will happen um some things will definitely not be the same in Books like Euron is effectively a completely different character. There are some characters in the books that will have a huge impact, like Aegon, uh, who are not on the show at all. So we've not seen exactly how the books will end, but we have seen some of the broad um, elements of it. So uh, just to take. Um, Jamie's arc, for example, I think that we will see, and we have seen in the books, that him moving away from Cersei in the same way we saw on the show, I think we will probably see him moving towards Brienne, as we saw on the show. Uh, how that ends, though, may not be exactly the same. So I think that um, it's, it's more a matter of them trying to tie things uh, off based on the fact that they've, uh, with the butterfly effect, uh, they left a couple of things out in the first couple of seasons, and those things have a huge impact later. Lady Stoneheart is going to have a huge impact in the books. Um, uh, I have a, a pet theory that I've got no evidence for it, but I have a feeling that she might do the uh, attack on um, uh, House Frey that we saw Arya do on the show, I think that that is something that she may well be doing, and they just gave Aya that bit of a plot line. So I think that thing, the same sorts of things will happen, not necessarily in the same order or in the same way, but the sort of the beats of the story will be the same. Um, Fran Pouch, $25, thank you so much, saying, I am one of those who is glad the show is over so we can get back to talking about the books. But since I know that's probably bad for driving traffic to your channel, have some money thank you so much i, I appreciate that um uh, i mean i am going to carry on talking about the books um and and that's uh, i i love the books so uh, don't worry about that my uh, for those who are um following the channel before the season i was working my way through a long series the events of robert's rebellion and the tower of joy um, and what was actually going on there. I've got a video there that's nearly finished, um, which is the the next bit of what actually happened at the Tower of Joy with the, fu the fundamental question of why did they fight? Why was it that the, the King's Guard and Ned's men 
fought, surely they were all on the same side at that point. So I'm going to be answering that question hopefully in there. And I've got two or three more in that series to go as well. So yes, I'll be getting back to the books, don't worry. What will happen though with this channel, uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to expand a little bit um, uh, into other things. So the plan is that uh, I will, as well as doing stuff on the books, and I'm going to be doing things on Lord of the Rings um, and the world of J.R.R. Tolkien, Middle Earth, um, partly because the books are there and I love them, um, but also in a couple of years' time or so, there will be the, uh, the TV show that they're going to be starting to make. So um, building up towards that, Westworld season through, season through, season three, um, will be happening there. The, the trailer for that has actually come out, or the first teaser trailer for that has come out, which looked amazing. Uh, but that will probably happen, my guess is, at the beginning of next year. Um, I covered season two. I'll, I'm really looking forward to doing season three. And there is a couple of other shows, things like uh, Black Mirror, perhaps The Witcher, that I may also try and cover. So the idea is that I'm, I'm going to carry on talking about the books and obviously the prequel when it happens. Uh, the But... I'm going to try and expand out into other areas as well. So uh, I'm really excited about the future for, for the channel. Um, uh, and there's so many great things out there uh, that I think that we can cover as well as doing uh, the um, Song of Ice and Fire books. Um, I haven't worked out exactly how to do all that yet. To be honest, I've been so focused on season eight uh, that I need to just take a take a week off at some point and just uh, recalibrate where I'm going with all of this. But that's the grand plan. And, and I'd love to have you guys along uh, for as much of that as you want to come along for. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Paige Popejoy says, uh, is it likely that Bran, towards the end of his life, would choose to pass on his green sight powers to his successor to the throne? Yeah, it's possible. Um, it's... Um, the, I, th I think the role of the Three-Eyed Raven as they set it up on the show is one that will be passed on to somebody else. Um, so I think that uh, he he probably will, whether he sort of dies in post or whether he um, uh, sort of quits at some point and goes off to be doing more Three-Eyed Raven stuff, we don't know. They deliberately left it... Um, uh, we they deliberately left it kind of vague. Um, we we know what the situation is going to be for the next few years, and that beyond that, it's not entirely clear. Drogon is obviously still out there somewhere, uh, so who knows what's going to happen with that? But uh, yeah, my best guess is that the the three eyed raven now that uh, the Weirwood Network have control of the Seven Kingdoms, as it were, they probably won't want to give up on that. So. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a very good chance that Bran could try and ensure that his successor is who he wants it to be. Um, let's have a look at a couple more questions from my patrons. Um, Amy says, um, I have come to wonder if Bran accepted the title so that Tyrion could rule. Bran plus the council itself is made up of... Uh, Bastards, cripples, and broken things, which seems to me to be maybe the point. If this is true, uh, the best characters actually did win the game. I almost think Bran has no intention of ruling, but was willing to wear the crown to give this group the opportunity to lead. Um, that's, I think, I think that's a very uh, generous uh, way to interpret Bran taking on the the crown, I think that he definitely, one thing I would, I would agree with this is that he definitely would, uh, he chose Tyrion because he thought he was competent and he would be able to do most of the actual ruling. Uh, Bran is not going to be a day-to-day -day ruler of Westeros. He is, as far as I can see from what the little that we saw, he'll sort of uh, come in, set some strategic direction, go away again. Um, that's what, and he'll leave the, the day-to-day -day business of how to um, rebuild King's Landing and, uh, and and forge the the new Six Kingdoms and all the rest of it, he will leave that to Tyrion and the Small Council. So I think that was a deliberate thing on his part. But I don't think it was because of any kind of benevolence towards Tyrion. I think it was just that he thought Tyrion would be 
good at it. Um, and the, I mean, they, there was a lot going on. So perhaps, you know, uh, I, I think I missed on the first way through, but the, the reason why Tyrion would be good at it now, the logic goes, is that finally he has got that kind of humility. He realizes that he has failed. He tried to stop Daenerys uh, from burning King's Landing. He failed. He tried to save his family. He failed. Um, he has to recognize the fact that the whole him being hands to the Queen to Daenerys did not go to plan. So that's why he tries to turn it down because he just thinks he's not up to it. And therefore he is suddenly this person who uh, does not want the job, therefore is probably going to be quite good at it. Uh, if you take the competence of Tyrion and add in um, a little less arrogance and a little bit more humility, then it probably makes him pretty perfect for being Hand of the King. Um, Jack Hurst says, do you think it's a missed opportunity with Arya not face-changing anyone this season? Why did the Dothraki not follow Jon after? And if someone in the Kelisar defeats a Carl, shouldn't he be the new Carl? Okay, so there's a couple of things here. Um, with Aya not face changing into anyone, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a missed opportunity because it always looks really cool. Um, but the fact is that I, I suspect that Aya will kill somebody important in the books because that's where her whole story arc is going. She is being trained up to be a really cool, sneaky assassin that has to lead her to somewhere. On the show, they obviously made her be the person who killed the Night King. I think that that meant that they weren't going to give her one of the other big kills down south. Um, so uh, that's why she sort of went down there and then didn't really do anything. Um, I think that uh, it, she will use face changing in the books in the same way that she has on the show, but not for the same exact thing so for, for example she used it with the phrase i don't I, I have a feeling it's not going to be her doing that it's going to be uh lady stonehard but she will do face changing at some point in the, uh, in the books uh, i'm pretty sure about that uh, and in terms of the carls and the kalasar now this was an interesting one because technically all of the kalasar were Daenerys's blood riders. She she told them they all were. They accepted it. They roared. They cheered. Back, this was back in Essos, um, and what that meant was that technically the the Cal they the Calisar as a whole. Yes, they would probably follow a new leader, but the blood riders they they would be sworn to avenge Daenerys's death. So that should have been what happened, was that they should have been uh, trying to kill John. Um, the showrunners just, I mean, I don't think they forgot about it, but the absence of the Dothraki in the second half of the last episode, I think, is because they realised that if they showed them, then they'd have to show them trying to kill John, and that wasn't where they wanted to go with it. So I think that that's, that's what it was, was that they had... Um, the Dothraki should have been trying to avenge Daenerys' death, but that didn't work for what the showrunners were trying to do at the time. Um, and a question from uh, Rick Hop or Hopper saying, in the battle for Winterfell, the Night King and Bran are under the weirwood tree looking each other in the eye. We cut to a close shot of the Night King and he cocks his head as if he just noticed something perplexing. What do you think was going on here? Um, I think, I mean, I think they were just having a stare off to start with. Um, I think Bran did look down at his chest as a kind of like a, so that's where he needs to be killed. Um, I think the Night King, it was just uh, like looking quizzically at him in a kind of, uh, uh, I am, I have finally achieved what I wanted a chance to kill you kind of way. I think that's what it was. I don't think there was any kind of uh, clever soul swap or anything like that going on. I, I, I know there are a few theories about that that have been going around, but uh, no, I don't think so. I think it was just a stare off and they just thought them just looking at each other 
wouldn't work, why don't they just like pop their head to one side or just glance down or something like that? So I think that's all that was going on. Uh, Kathy Stark says, uh, a chill went up my spine when Bran said he would search for Drogon. The show stated Bran as the Three-Eyed Raven is the memory of the world. Uh, he got this way because of the children of the forest, who we are led to believe created the Night King to help them in their fight with mankind, because men were wiping out the children of the forest and cutting down the sacred weirwoods. Um, how much of Bran's consciousness is the children of the forest? Might they? Might not they be using him in a way to avenge the evil done to them by men? So this is a good question because it's uh, it's what I was picking up on earlier about Bran is not just the Bran anymore. He is the uh, the the Three-Eyed Raven. Now, the way the show have done this is that it's very much this idea that the Three-Eyed Raven is a post, a position that gets passed down and these have gone back through history. That's not what the situation is in the books. In the books, the, there are green seers who are all hooked up to the Weirwood Network and they, they appear to happen sort of concurrently, not just like in succession one after the other. So that's a very different thing that was going on there. He is part Children of the Forest, he's part Blood Raven, he's part Bran, he's part everything. He's, that's what's going on there. But fundamentally, he is the Weirwood Network, and they are trying to protect Westeros as they see it. And that needs protecting against ice, and that needs protecting against fire. So that is why Bran was pushing to try and create both ice defeated and fire defeated. He was after Danny's uh, uh, death, basically. Um, Deborah Adams say um, uh, asks, in your view, why did Danny's final presentation as a self-deceived, cruel conqueror feel less than easy to accept for viewers? Um, I like the way Tyrion explains the mechanics to join in episode six in the cell, but as a viewer, I struggled to feel fully convinced. Um, I think there's a couple of layers to this. Um, one is the fact that um, Danny is, um, well, they didn't play up as much as perhaps they could have done the, the Danny's uh, anger side, or at least um, well, her fire and blood side really rather than her anger side, I should say, or at least when they did, they did it to people that we didn't really care about that much. So they seemed to make a big deal about her roasting uh, Randall Tarly and Dick on Tarly. But most people just thought, well, I mean, they were bad guys. We, we didn't much like them. Um, but clearly they wanted us to see that as more significant than it was. Uh, so I think they picked the wrong things to use as examples to start with. Um, I think one other reason why it was a shock was actually that they had presented, and I think this is deliberate in the books and also in the show, I'll give them credit for this, they presented Danny as, uh, yeah, a more of a hero type. She's sickly beautiful, she's got the blonde hair and the blue eyes and all the rest of it. She's, um, it, it's hard to look at her certainly in the first few seasons of the show and think this is an evil person. She's going around, she was very put upon in the first season in particular, um, uh, effectively sold into slavery, marriage to a man she didn't know, um, uh, and then all the way through um, her time in Essos was her own struggle. This was, everything she achieved was her. Um, and so I think that we were brought into her story. And that is why it felt so jarring that she would suddenly turn like that. They did build up to it. They gave us all of the, the cues, but it still felt very jarring for us because we liked the character and then the character did something we didn't like. And that is always going to be quite jarring. Um, Dracarys Noir says, I absolutely hate that the political structure of Westeros didn't change, but the small council being made up of outsiders has potential. 
What are your thoughts on the new small council appearing not to have a master of laws or master of whispers? Yeah, well, the just a quick word on the new small council, and, and I, one of my other patrons a moment ago also mentioned this uh, being like the cripples, bastards, and broken things. They, they are. So we have the, the two, the not many characters we have on the show uh, are lowborn. Most of them are noble lords or ladies or something. Uh, but a couple are Bron and Davos, and they are both on this new um, uh, council. Sam was clearly, he was uh, put upon through his life, picked on. He was an outsider. Brienne was uh, exactly the same. She was denied what she felt was her vocation. Um, Tyrion also was, he he was um, a laughing stock through his life. So all of that lot as a new council are part of this cripples, bastards and broken things who inherit the world. So uh, that's where we're at. In terms of the master of laws and master of whisperers, um, I think it's simply that they didn't have enough characters there. Um, and so they thought, you know what, well, we'll just say, as is entirely reasonable, well, we'll try and find someone. Um, so I, I don't think there's too much that we need to be making from that. The Master of Whisperers thing is intriguing because why you need one if you've got Bran who can find out everything, um, it's, yeah, it's a slightly moot point. But um, uh, Master of Laws, then I think they can just, there's, there's no characters who've immediately shown themselves to be great at lawmaking. So, uh, there wasn't an obvious candidate for any of that. There obviously was one for Master of Sales. Um, there obviously was one for being the Grand Maester and all the rest of it. So, so the the characters that they had fitted those roles, and they didn't have a character who fitted the role of being the um, the new Master of Laws. Um, and with Varys gone, Master of Whisperers. So, so that's I, I think it's as simple an answer as that. Um, Let's go back to uh, the chat. See, there's a couple of questions uh, from uh, Super Chat. I think I spotted going by. Um, where did I get to? Um, uh, Anu Start says, why did Littlefinger give the girl in Winterfell a coin? This is, uh, I think, going back to last season, there was a sort of a very brief um, shot of uh, Littlefinger uh, giving a coin to uh, one of the servants in Winterfell. This led to uh, speculation going rife that he was perhaps paying for the faceless men, somebody to take his place so that uh, he wouldn't die and all the rest of it. Um, I think we just, the simplest answer here is almost always right. It's just that they were trying to show that Littlefinger was doing what Littlefinger always does, plotting. Uh, he had a network of spies down in King's Landing. He would obviously try and build up a network of spies up in Winterfell as he was based up there. So that seemed to be what was going on. It was just a little bit of character development. Um, I don't think that he was doing anything particularly um, underhand in terms of like the faceless men thing. I don't think that works at all. There was also a passing shot of him talking to uh, Lords Glover and Royce um, as a sort of just generally him plotting with them. So I, I think that it's easy to take one scene out of context and say, well, perhaps this means something. And I don't think in that um, instance it did particularly. Uh, John uh, Sebastiani says Dinklage gave the best performance of the series this episode, especially the first half. His pain was so real it reminded me of all he lost. Yeah, I, Peter Dinklage did fantastically um, uh, in uh, the first half of that episode. I thought it was brilliant. I, I think uh, also hat off to um, uh, Amelia Clark, I forgot her name for a moment there, um, in episode five, I think she did an 
excellent job uh, there. A lot of the actors did really, really good work in this season. Um, Gwendolyn Christie was uh, astonishing as always. So there, there, there are there are lots, but I would agree. Yeah, Peter Dinklage in episode six was fantastic. Um, Bridget Walsh saying, with just the bullet points, what do you think the theme or message is of the show as a whole? I mean, I think um, George R. R. Martin is deliberately not writing an allegory, so I don't think that he's trying to do a message or a series of messages. I think what he's trying to do is um, give us a story like Tolkien did with The Lord of the Rings that is applicable that we can take things from it um, without it being him spoon feeding us something. Uh, that said, I think that there are clear messages here about power and how the pursuit of power um, is corrupting and it's dangerous. I think that there's clearly, lots of people have mentioned this, there's an anti-war theme. I think there's a, the, the little folk, the small folk, the cripples, bastards and broken things. This is something which has gone through a huge amount all the way through it. The, the people who suffer the most are the people who do not have the power. And that is definitely a theme which has been going through it. I think it, you people are drawing environmental change messages from it. And I think George R. R. Martin has said, well, that wasn't what he was intending, but he certainly sees that that's very applicable. Um, uh, there are certainly in the books some quite strong um, uh, messages about upsetting the status quo in terms of uh, sort of a more feminist interpretation of how things should be done. It's very, very gendered when you think about it at the beginning. All of the leaders of the houses are all men the only men are allowed to be members of the knight's watch or the maesters or uh, the high septon or anything like this is very gendered so i think there's clearly something that he's sort of trying to send a message there but overall it's not a series that i think has a this is the the message you should take this one away from it it's he's written in a way that we can draw many things from it uh, Chris Stanley says, Danny always kills her enemy directly and takes pleasure in it. Instead of torching the city, why didn't she go straight for Cersei? That, I mean, it, it's, it's a very good question. I, th I think that um, it, would make, it would have made sense for me more for her to go in straight away and try and burn down Cersei. The only thing that I think when I look at this is that it's clear that the trigger for what happened was a sight of the Red Keep. Um, not the bells. The bells were just what paused the action, gave everyone a chance to take a deep breath. Uh, the, the showrunners have said it, and it's very clear from the direction that she she's there and she looks and then the shot cuts to the Red Keep. And that, when she's staring at it, that is what seems to change her mind. And the reason why that seems to be a trigger is because this is the ancestral home of the Targaryens. This is where her ancestors ruled from. That's where the Iron Throne is. And Cersei was still in power. And she wanted that for herself. So she didn't want to burn down the Red Keep because she wanted to rule from it. That That is the, the, the basic uh, thing that I'm getting from it. Yes, she did a, a little bit of burning of it, but um, it was more a letting out anger and rage than a calculated thought. Um, so, and that's the other part of this equation, I think, is that uh, if we try and uh, say, well, why did she do this path rather than that path? It was when Amelia Clark explains it, it's just, it's this building up of loss and pain and mourning and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and then she, that, it finds its expression in anger. This was not a rational decision that she made. This was an expression of everything that has been going on in her life. Um, and that's what was happening. So, um, yeah, it would probably make more sense if she'd just gone in and tried to kill Cersei, but that's not, it wasn't a rational decision that she was making at the time. 
Uh, Donna Daly, thank you so much for the super chat saying, I believe that A Dream of Spring was originally to be called A Time for Wolves. Yes, it was. This makes sense with the ending. Do you think that implies that the Starks' time is near its end? I don't think they'll have kids. Um, in the books or on the show, I mean, I think it's probably going to be roughly the same. Um, yeah, so I don't think that Arya will be having kids anytime soon. I don't think Bran's going to be having kids anytime soon. I think Rickon will die in the books as he died in the show. Um, and I think really this means that you're looking at Sansa and they've lived it open with her. I think that she, for the first time in her life, uh, doesn't uh, or has control and therefore it, it's, she's being set up almost like Elizabeth I of England, this kind of, uh, who was called the Virgin Queen. She never took a husband um, and they're kind of setting her up in that kind of way. Now, that doesn't mean that there would be no more Starks. She could adopt somebody and make them a Stark, uh, for example. But yeah, the the Stark line itself is definitely in danger. And I think that we're, what we're not going to get in the books in the same way that we didn't get on the show is this 20 years later thing. We're not going to see. We're just going to be left with the idea that it could be the end for the Starks. Um, who knows? Maybe Aya will return. Um, Nathaniel White, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, didn't see uh, a question there, uh, so um, but thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, similarly, Danny K, thank you. Um, Deep Solstice says, "What would you have done differently if you were the Game of Thrones showrunner on any season?" Um, I think I would have kept in. Uh, well, I would have kept it going as George R. R. Martin said he wanted twelve seasons or something like that. Um, uh, I, I think I would have um, kept in some of the other plots. The main one that I would want to keep in there is the Fagon Aegon plot, because I think that includes so many extra elements, and I think it would have made more sense of what's going to happen at the end. I think it will, it will show what's going on in Dawn, because Dawn felt quite disappointing because they haven't included uh, that element of what was going on there. A lot of Dawn's planning is to do with what's happening with Aegon, Aegon. Um, so, yeah, I think I would have just included an extra bit and then it allowed the, the story to carry on a little bit more. So also that means that we don't just get these jump cuts and miss out all the travel. Uh, the travel is where so many of the best bits of character building happen. Um, Donald Peoples says, so the children of the forest are effectively ruling humanity now. Is the Three-Eyed Raven not an amalgam of countless children, Blood Raven and himself? Yet they haven't made it clear on the show, uh, the Three-Eyed Raven that it seems to be a post of some kind or a position. Um, the, they haven't made clear whether Blood Raven's predecessor in that position on the show was another human or Child of the Forest or whatever, but um, yeah, it's it's um, I, the way I see it is it's the Weirwood Network who are in control rather than the Children of the Forest per se. Uh, there will be Children of the Forest in there as well, uh, but Bran is in there um, and um, Blood Raven is in there so, and so on. Uh, Stacey May saying, generally most people are disappointed in some way with the movies or TV series when they have read the books. Difficult to add all the details. Do you agree? Um, yes, I, th I think so. I mean, my, I mean, everyone has different experiences with this, but my general experience is that the people who hated the show most tended to be more likely to be book people, and the people who loved it the most tended to be show only people um and because some of the things that people didn't like were because it was going against what we know and think is happening in the books so yes that's sort of broadly and, and those those are broad brush strokes it's not, not exactly the case uh for everyone uh but yeah broadly speaking a lot of um concern comes when the when the the show or film or whatever it is doesn't um, cover everything that's in the books because you rarely can. Um, 
And this is why when things like Lord of the Rings films came out and everyone had loved them, it was because they were so faithful. Um, they, they missed out some things, but broadly speaking, they were so faithful and that was why everybody uh, loved that. Um, William Munkiers says, any parting thoughts on Benjamin or the Waif? Um, ben, well, so on, in the show, Benjamin, yeah, I think he, unfortunately, he did die in that episode that it looked like he died. Um, similarly, the Waif, I think, died when we thought she died. Um, in terms of parting thoughts on them, I think Benjamin was quite a tragic character in the uh, in the show, I think he's a very tragic character in the books, incidentally. I think that he knew about what happened with Rhaegar and Lyanna, and so he went off into exile, effectively, in the, into the uh, the Night's Watch, um, uh, yeah, out of shame for not saying anything. Um, I did a whole video about that, if you're interested. Um, on the show, they kind of turned him into this cat who helps Starks out north of the wall, which is nice. It didn't quite give him the, the depth that I think that he will have in the books. The Waif, um, yeah, I mean, I quite liked the Waif character. I think that the, um, I, I, we can now put to bed, I think, categorically, anyone who's saying, is Arya actually secretly the Waif? Is that what's going on here? Well, no, there's absolutely nothing in the final season that suggests that's the case. Um, she is Arya Stark. Um, um, so that's the that's the only real thoughts I have on them. They they didn't appear in this season, so I don't think there's anything extra that we can add. Um, let's go back to um, uh, oh Gemma's in the chat. Hello, Gemma, uh, Secrets of the Citadel. Um, we were talking about the videos that we were. Um, uh, somebody was asking a question when we're going to pick up on that series that we could never properly name to do with small but cool houses. Uh, so let's talk about that and we'll try and um, sort out time to, to finish off that series. Uh, but let's go back to a couple of questions from my patrons. Um, Helen's little sister says, regarding the saga of Daenerys Targaryen's desire to break the wheel, we were never introduced to the gods in the Westerosi world. As I see it, the gods knew the progression of human conflict over the future millennia and set all the dominoes to fall exactly the way they did. Daenerys was the last spoke. So, did the actions of the gods set in motion eons ago lead to the outcome as shown in the final episode? Or are they now seeing the fruits of their work with Bran the Broken first of his name? Um, so this is a, a fascinating question. The, the role of the gods in the books, just to start with, the George R. R. Martin has been very clear. We're not going to see the gods in the books. They're never going to stride the, the world. Uh, we're never going to actually see their direct impact. Now, what he is interested in is not the gods themselves, uh, the reality of them or not. What he is interested in is the human response to them. Uh, the fact that some people believe in R'hllor completely is incredibly important for the, um, the the plot developing the way Melisandre believes it um, and plenty of other characters in the books as well. That drives the story forward and that's the thing that George R. R. Martin finds fascinating is the impact of belief on characters and interactions. So that is where we're at on the books and I don't think that in the books we're going to see ever any proof of what the gods are or do or anything like that. Um, in the show, um, no, I, th I think they've probably picked up and done the same kind of thing. The, the idea that um, the gods uh, knew the progression of human conflict uh, and try and set it up so that Bran would end there, I think the only bit that I would go with that is this idea that the moment that we accept that this isn't actually Bran who is sitting on the Iron Throne, not the Iron Throne, but is the king, um, this is actually the Three-Eyed Raven, the Weirwood Network in effect. We have to, and the fact that they're outside of time, we have to accept that this isn't just some plan that Bran cooked up in the last season. This is something which has always been what they've been envisioning happening. 
So uh, the Weirwood network always understood that that was what was going to happen. So uh, in, to that extent, yes. But then whether or not do they count as being gods, clearly the Northerners talk about them as the old gods, but whether they count as gods because you can point at them and you know, know what they are and they are the sum of human understanding and memories and lived experiences and the like, that's a completely different issue. So um, I think on the show, on the, in the books, no, I don't think we're going to get any evidence of the uh, the gods on the show. Just what was going on with the old gods I, would be the thing I would try and draw out. Um, Lady Beverly says, I think we're all trying to come to terms with it all ending, and that's why we're feeling like this. Uh, thinking about it, though, they all sort of got what they wanted. I feel everyone could have stood up for John a bit as he had to execute Daenerys um, and uh, never really understood what she felt had to be done at Winterfell, Dawn, etc. Was it just total devastation and destruction if they didn't bend the knee? Well, this was the, the implication, I think, of the sort of the totalitarian Daenerys that we see at the end is that, yes, she would... Uh, use fire and blood to make sure that she, um, in her words, mind, liberated all the different cities in Westeros. So she would go to Dawn and say, you must bow the knee, and if they don't, then fire and blood would happen. That was effectively what happened with Aegon's conquest, was that Aegon would uh, say to people, you must bend the knee to me, and if they did, great. If they didn't, then the dragon would come and start burning down their castles and raising things to the ground. So actually what she's doing, again, this is not talking about a little bit earlier, she is the echo of Aegon the Conqueror. Um, that was what she was threatening. And the end of Daenerys is showing the end of Targaryen rule, this kind of bookending of, uh, of Targaryen rule being Aegon the Conqueror on Beleriand the Black Red and Daenerys Targaryen on Drogon. So, so that's where that's where we're at. And yes, the short answer is that she was just going to annihilate anyone who did not bend the knee. Um, let's uh, go. I've got actually one more question from my patrons before going back to the chat. Um, uh, Jason Gard says, I feel like the Night King and the White Walkers were a warning about the evil of men. Uh, so I was okay seeing the zombie aspects of the show uh, scuttled up in favour of a human focus in the latter half of the final season. Um, yeah, so I think that they tried to, um, on the show, they definitely built up the kind of the otherworldliness of the the White Walkers. They, we never heard them talk. We never understood what it was that they really wanted other than to bring death. So they were this kind of, um, they were the others. That's what they were. They othered. We did not know who they were or what they wanted and all the rest of it. For mo the most part, we didn't know how they could be defeated. So they were this kind of mysterious threat. The threat, that, that being ice, the threat from fire was one that we knew and understood and had a face in Daenerys that we sympathised with because we understood and bought into her story. So I think that was the kind of the dynamic they're going to going with. These two, these twin threats to Westeros, one of which was uh, you know, completely ununderstandable. The, the kind of classic zombie thing that they just keep on coming and there's nothing you can do about it and uh, and, and you, you don't have to feel bad about killing any of the White Walkers, because all, all they were was trying to kill you. But with Daenerys, they were trying to show uh, that there's a more human side to this and trying to get us to understand what was going on. So I think that was, for me, that's what the juxtaposition was that they were trying to uh, draw out. Um, let's go back to um, the chat. Um, mm, 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 Donald Peoples, thank you so much. George R. Martin said that the foreshadowing for the end game can be found in the first book, future video, perhaps. Uh, yeah, so the when George R. R. Martin started writing the books, he thought he was writing a trilogy. So book one 
is the first third of the story that he thought he was writing. And then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So what has happened is that the book one is a lot more heavily loaded with symbolism and hints and uh, foreshadowing, as you say. And uh, uh, so we can look back at that and take um, note of what was going on there as, as a hint to what might be happening at the end. So one big example here is the Isle of Faces. Now, the Isle of Faces didn't really appear on the show at all. Um, I hope that it might have done, but then it became reasonably clear that they weren't going that way. So the Isle of Faces, however, is mentioned in book one, and uh, it's mentioned a couple of times. They show that this is where the pact happened uh, between the children of the forest and the first men. It's uh, the hints are that this is a, a, a sort of a hub for the Weirwood Network. Howland Reed went there just before um, all the events of Robert's Rebellion. So it clearly is very important. And then it largely goes silent for the next few books. And they don't really, George R. Martin doesn't really mention it again. So um, the just like a couple of random mentions here and there. So I think that's the kind of thing that we can look back on and say he was clearly teeing that up having to get the information out that he probably, if he'd known he was going to be doing so many other books, he would have drip fed that out over a series of books rather than pushed all the information out straight away. So that's the kind of thing that we can, uh, we can be looking out for in, in book one. And yeah, it's uh, definitely the kind of video I could be uh, happily making. Joshua Modi, thank you so much. Uh, didn't see a question attached to the Super Chat. Similarly, uh, Crichton Allen, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. The Forgotten Borough says, Hi, Robert, you're a huge inspiration. Oh, thank you. Um, with the way the show has ended, is it possible that John is actually the mama's dragon Quaith warned Danny about? Um, right, so the mama's dragon is part of a series that, that, that Quaith um, in the books gives Daenerys this long list of things she has to beware. Um, and they're mostly reasonably clear to understand. Um, the Mama's Dragon, this sort of ties in with the visions that she had in the House of the Undying as well. Um, I think that that is a reference to Fagon, Aegon, uh, the, the character he's a book I've mentioned a few times, so I'll just very quickly give the background for those people who are uh, show-only people. Um, in the books, there is another person knocking around claiming to be a Targaryen. Uh, and this character uh, claims to be uh, Aegon, baby Aegon, grown up, uh, who was Rhaegar's firstborn son, and therefore has an even greater claim than uh, Daenerys does, and even Jon would if he were... Uh, um, um, when, when the information comes out about his parentage in the books. So uh, he's over, he starts off over in Essos and he's been, there's a huge plot going on with um, Illyrio and Varys and, and the Golden Company. And, and he eventually, he comes over, at the very end, he comes over in a, an invasion um, and uh, he's down in the, just near King's Landing actually, near Storm's End. Uh, so that's what's going on with, him there. So I think that that is a reference to that character and that is going to be a huge plot point in the Winds of Winter that we've had absolutely nothing of in the um, in the show. So uh, no, I don't think it's referring to John. Um, I think that this is one of those things, Quaith, the, the, having the character there and the thing she said, they included her because at that time they hadn't realized exactly which bits they were going to have to chop out. Um, so she was a cool character um, and they just gave her a little little bit of a moment, uh, but they didn't pick up on it at all. So I don't think on the show we should pay much attention at all to Wait, In the books, she will have an impact though. Uh, Johan uh, Abberton, thank you so much, saying uh, thanks for the amazing analysis, as always. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, who do you what, what do you think of the lack of a master of whispers? Is it a nod to Bran's power through his access to information? Yeah, I covered this a little bit earlier. I think that the, um, 
this there's a very practical reason for this which is that they wanted the small council to be people that we knew and some of those characters had obvious jobs that they would do so really uh davos was always going to be master of sales um you've got um sam who is always going to be the grand maester so so some of these are very obvious what what's going to happen but then they kind of run out of characters who would be hanging around in king's landing so i think just on a very practical level the two jobs the master of laws and the master of whispers uh they didn't have an obvious character who would be good at doing that so they it just made sense for them to say okay they're they're um, vacant posts at the moment I think the the Master of Whispers seems to be more of the odd one because, yes, Bran can do a huge amount of that spying. But uh, we have to say that Bran, uh, Bran's powers are limited. Yes, he's hugely powerful. Yes, he seems to be able to basically look and discover what he wants when he wants. But he only finds things out when he goes looking for them. Uh, and we saw that actually in this last episode. So he said, oh, I'll go and try and find Drogon. He doesn't know where Drogon is unless he goes and tries to find him. So actually, although Bran would be very useful in information gathering, uh, the the getting the in, to finding out what it is you need to know about bit is why you need to have your spy network going on. That's why you need to have your Master of Whispers. So, uh, th there wasn't an obvious character to give that to, which is why they didn't, uh, but I think they probably will need to have one still, even though Bran can do lots of things. Uh, and Clinton Alfonso saying, why didn't Dawn and the Iron Islands also leave? Uh, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I cover this one a little bit as well. Um, I think it would have made sense if they'd both tried to leave. Uh, the Iron Islands and Dawn both have a history of being independent rather than being part of the, the sort of the greater uh, Seven Kingdoms. Dawn uh, sort of kept its independence for a lot longer even than the North did. Um, so my, if, if I were to try and uh, charitably interpret what was happening in that Great Council, it would be something along the lines of um, the, the Starks had a position of power there. There were 18 people in that um, Great Council, as it were. You had the three Stark siblings, you had Brienne, who was sworn sword to Sansa Stark, you had Davos, who was uh, effectively hand, hand to the king to John, um, you had uh, Edmure Tully, who clearly did what Sansa wanted to do. You had Robin Arryn, who um, probably still had a crush on Sansa. You had Jon Royce, who seemed to spend most of the last couple of seasons being right-hand man to Sansa. Um, you're already there up to eight people who are just on the north side there was one other person who wasn't named who seemed to be dressed like a northerner at least one maybe even two um then when you add in people like uh, gendry who uh, obviously last we saw him he was declaring undying love for Arya. so you know uh, there's an influence there as well um it's the the point I'm trying to make is that the North had a blocking vote in that council. It may have looked like this was the, all the lords of the land coming together to decide between them who's going to be ruling. Actually, if it was ever voted on, then whoever the North wanted and whatever the North wanted happened. That was just the way that that council appeared to have been made up. So, um, uh, it, they could have shown us with shown that uh, the new Prince of Dawn demands independence for Dawn or Yara saying, well, I demand independence. But the, I think they just short, short circuited it and said, actually, you know what, they're not going to get it. So we don't need to show them this. They, it was already quite a long episode and that wasn't um, necessary for the, the bit of story that they were trying to tell there, which was Bran becoming king. Um, let's go back to my, uh, some questions from my patrons.
And these are a series of questions here now about um, the books and the show and how the, the two may well be different. As I say, I'm going to be doing a video on this uh, at some point, hopefully next week, just setting out uh, what I think the key difference is going to be, what we can expect in the books that might be different to the show, and where the similarities are likely to be. So um, uh, there's a video coming on this one, but I'm, I'll give you my uh, initial thoughts now. So anime lover Nicole uh, says, George has said that the ending will be the same, but also different. Uh, he did. He uh, he did on his blog post. He, he said, uh, are they going to be the same uh, yes and no and yes and no and yes and no was what he literally said. Uh, do you think the sack of King's Landing could be Fagon and John Connington? And when John hears the bells, he will go kill mode because of his PTSD from the Battle of the Bells in the Rebellion. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on here. I think that there's a very good chance that what happens in King's Landing is very different in the books. I So... We've got Fagon, who will, who's got the Golden Company very close to King's Landing. I think that there's a good chance that they will attack King's Landing at some point in the winds of winter. Um, and so they may well even be in control of it uh, in the, the way that we've got uh, currently, or we did have Cersei in control of it. It may well be that actually Aegon gets control of it and then Danny comes in with her dragons to confront him. And so it may be that that is when the uh, the burning of King's Landing or whatever it is happens. Uh, so I think things might happen in a slightly different order. But leaving that to one side, in terms of the question here, uh, talking about John Connington and the Battle of the Bells, the Battle of the Bells was a battle in Robert's Rebellion. So this is like four or so years before the story that we've got and what happened there was Robert Baratheon was uh, in the uh, town of Stony Sept, and then the Loyalist for forces, the Mad King's army, effectively led by John Connington, um, knew this and were searching for him uh, through the streets and, and to, uh, in the houses of Stony Sept. And then that took them a while, they didn't find him, and then Ned Stark's army effectively came in uh, and saved the day. And their arrival was, um, oh, at their arrival, the town rang the bells in order to try and get the people to stay indoors. So that was what happened when it was called the Battle of the Bells because as the armies were attacking, then the bells were ringing. So, yes, I like the idea that the bells which we had in uh, episode six, were some sort of a callback to the Battle of the Bells. They, they didn't seem to be, the, the purpose of the bells ringing seemed to be slightly different. A number of people have pointed out the fact that Davos says that back in season two, I've never heard the ringing of bells uh, announcing surrender. And that's exactly what Tyrion seems to think that they do in episode uh, five. But that's a continuity error, I think, more than anything else. Uh, so I think, yes, the idea that the, the bells will be important in King's Landing in connection with John Connington, I think, is, is a really good point, and that may well happen. Um, Ali uh, Al-Muhanna says, how much can we use season eight to predict the ending in the books? So, yeah, I think this is... Um, uh, and Bear Island Josh actually says, do you think the final season and ending of the show will have any influence over the ending of the books? So to take the second bit of that first uh, from Bear Island Josh, I don't think that George R. R. Martin is going to change what he's doing based upon what he's seen on the TV show. He, he's, he's been very clear that he's set up the ending with little bits of foreshadowing and hints and character development all the way through these books, and he can't now go back and change all of that so he's he's locked into the broad ending that he's got but he also he's a he's a writer who discovers where he's going as he goes he doesn't plot out the details along the way this is why the ending that we've got in the show which is what george r, r. martin would uh, or, or the basis of what george r. r martin said to the showrunners 
we don't know for certain as if that's going to be exactly what happens in the books. So George R. R. Martin will not change the ending of the books based upon the show, but uh, Ali was saying, how much can we use it to predict the ending? I think what we can do is we can see the main beats of this. This is the way that George R. R. Martin talks about it, the main beats of the, of the story, the uh, being things like the, the defeat of the army of the dead happening not at the very end, but a bit beforehand, so that then we get to go back down to the south and deal with whatever's going on there. That seems likely. I think, pardon me, I think Daenerys um, committing some kind of fire and blood, uh, what we would call an atrocity these days, I think that is quite likely. I think that John killing Daenerys is quite likely. Um, uh, for those who are interested, if you go back a couple of years, you'll find I did a video with the rather prescient now title of Will John Kill Daenerys, uh, which was based on my interpretation of her visions in the House of the Undying. And my interpretation of all of that led me to think that we were, we were there was a heavy hint that John would kill Daenerys. Uh, so I think that there's some of these main beats of the story will definitely books. But George R. R. Martin was very clear that two things. First of all, um, the he didn't get a chance to tell them about what would happen with all of the minor characters. So the minor characters, uh, their, their fates may well be different. And secondly, there are lots of characters in the books that aren't in the show. And therefore, what is going to happen in the books is going to be different because there are different things going on in the books. So the large... The, to summarise all of this, the big beats of what is happening will happen in the books, but the details will be different. Um, and I think some of the ordering and timing of it uh, will also be different. But as I said, I'm going to put all of this into uh, a big uh, video at some point, hopefully next week. Maura Lee, thank you so much. For, you had gave two uh, questions as well. Um, saying, how do you see John's, Danny's, and fake Aegon's story arcs playing out as the story moves forward? Um, so how do you see fire pushed back in the books as compared to on the show? So I think, fitting in with what I've just been saying, I think that fire will be pushed back. I think that, uh, again, we cannot end the story with dragons in Westeros, I think they will be gone. I think there's a very good chance that at least two of them will die, as they did uh, here. The third Drogon may fly off. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's a few hints of dragons flying off to places like Valyria in the books, so that could well happen. But um, uh, I think, broadly speaking, we've got um, Fagon and his invasion, that's going to happen first. Then Danny is going to be exposing his lie because he isn't, I think, he isn't actually a Targaryen. I think he's a Blackfire, um, which is a little bit of complicated book lore for those who, who don't know about the Blackfires. Blackfires are basically like a little uh, a branch of the Targaryens from a uh, hundred years or so ago um, who went off into exile um, and on trying to come back and claim the throne. I think he's a Blackfire rather than a Targaryen, and I think that Danny will expose him for this. Um, and so I think that will happen. Then I think she will get involved with the battle against the army of the dead or the confrontation against the army of the dead. I think that may well happen, not necessarily up at Winterfell. Some of it will probably happen at Winterfell, but could even be down towards the Isle of Faces. Uh, but I think that, yes, John will end up killing her, and that is how the fire bit is pushed back. Uh, and the second part of your questions here, Maura, was about the Night King and the White Walker. Uh, the Night King being a show-only character, uh, will this be a, the resolution be a huge battle, like in the show, or will there be a more peaceful compromise, like another pact? Um, one thing I am reasonably certain of is that the answer to all of this is not going to be violence. That is not going to be the... Um, George R. R. Martin is not going to write a story where 
he shows the horrors of battle and then at the end of it it's oh actually you know what the way to win this the way for humans to survive is actually to kill people i can't see that being the ending so the the i think there will be a huge battle involving the others i think it will happen at winterfell i think uh, another one of my videos the Horn of Winter and the Crypts of Winterfell. I think that the Stark dead will rise and fight for the Starks in that. I think that that is what uh, we got sort of a hint of that, but they were just fighting on the other side in on the show. But I think they will rise and fight for the Starks. Um, and I think that, again, it is the crucial bit here is to do with their creation and what they're actually wanting. I think we will learn more of what they're actually wanting, and I think that is going to feed into the resolution rather than what on the show, yes, Bran manipulated things to make it all happen, but fundamentally, Arya killed the Night King with a lucky strike. It was a guess, it was random. Um, she, she did not know that a Valyrian steel blade in the heart in front of a weirwood tree was what uncreated the Night King. Bran knew that, uh, and he created the situation that allowed that to happen. But she did not know that. And I, I do not think that the solution to all of this is going to be um, uh, a complete accident uh, or an act of violence. I think that there will be some kind of understanding of what the others want that could lead to a new pact uh, or it could lead to uh, giving them what they want and that's what gets them pushed back um so uh we've got oh we've just got a couple more questions from my patrons uh, to come uh so let's go back to the uh chat Um, Donna Daly says, in the show, the face of ice is the Night King of Fire, Danny. There is no face of ice in the books. Do you think there will be? Will they be relatable? Um, I think this is an excellent question because the I, I do not know. I do not think that they will introduce a Night King. Um, but the... I, I think that the reason why they introduced the Night King was because they wanted a character to, as you say, it's like to be relatable for us to understand. They, they do this for all the armies. They have a character at the head that we can see them and we can look into their eyes. Harry Strickland with the Golden Company, um, uh, Grey Worm with the Unsullied and so on. We have a character that kind of represents the army. And that is broadly what was happening with the Night King and the Army of the Dead. I think that George R. R. Martin will not need to rely on that tool of having a character to represent the entire um, uh, entirety of the others. I think that he will give us a greater understanding of who they are, what they want um, through um, partly magical means, um, uh, but also figuring stuff out rather than just it being, uh, here's a character that we need to deal with. So I think that he will he will write a better way around that than just having a character, if that makes sense. Um, Stan Tehe says, was that Howland Reed on the council? Um, why didn't uh, anyone mention Aegon or John? Um, Right, so was it Howland Reed on the council? Uh, there was a character who looked like he could have been from the neck, um, but we didn't really, we, we didn't discover who these there were. I think there were four other lords who were there who didn't really say stuff, um, and they were just there to be like uh, anonymous noble lords in, in the great council. Um, I think this is just a matter of them wanting to have a character who having extra people to bulk it out rather than them bringing in Howland Reed. I think they would have told us if it was going to be Howland Reed because they will know how much the fandom would love it and they love um, 
doing little nods to the books with things like showing us Dawn the Sword or showing us the Horn of Winter, things like that. I think that they would want us to know it was how to read. Um, so my presumption is it wasn't. If it was, that's even more of the the Great Council being completely weighted on the Stark side because obviously he's a animan of the Starks. So um, uh, I think that no is that probably wasn't Howland Reed, but we we don't know. Um, why didn't anyone mention Aegon or John in terms of like being the king? I assume well, this is. Uh, probably for two reasons. Firstly, that he was a prisoner of Grey Worm at the time. So Grey Worm was wanting him to be killed. And so the negotiation there was uh, if if they were, if he wanted to kill John and Sansa and the Starks were wanting him to be sort of freed and allowed to be, um, just go off and do what he wants, the compromise was to send him to the wall. So, so the, he was, um, uh, discussed, but in terms of whether he should be king, I think it basically it was accepted that they didn't say this, but it was accepted that that wasn't on the table at all. Uh, he was under uh, under arrest by the Unsullied, who wanted to kill him. So it was a matter of whether or not they could get John out alive, rather than whether or not to make him king. And then uh, Tyrion went into his little speech about Bran. So they so it became a slightly moot point then. Uh, Catherine Harris says, just getting into the books and your commentary certainly enhances my understanding going in. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, Richard Hop or Hopper, I still don't know which, uh, I, I'm mispronouncing your name at least once there. Uh, John being half Targaryen was set up as being so filled with portent, it doesn't seem to pay off in any way except being a possible threat to Danny's claim to the throne. Why make him a Targaryen? Um, so this was at the heart of all of that bit of story. Um, so the fact that John was a half Targaryen led to the breakdown in his relationship with Daenerys. Um, the fact that he was half Targaryen led to Varys betraying uh, Daenerys. It led to um, Daenerys thinking that everybody on that sort of side, Sansa and Tyrion and Jon, all of them had betrayed her. So it added into this mix that, uh, that was going on there that led to her doing what she did with the burning of King's Landing. So uh, there's that element there. I think on the show, Yes, I'm quite sympathetic to what you're saying is that actually it didn't, it was a big reveal, but then didn't turn out to be as plot critical as we might have thought. In the books, I tend to think that this will be treated as a more thematic thing because John is being set up, uh, and he was in the show, uh, definitely is being in the books as being this great hero on a hero's journey. He is the um the, the highlight or the the, uh, the perfection of every kind of trope of what a fantasy fiction hero should be he is the boy who was brought up um an orphan child brought up in a castle not knowing who his parents were um and then but secretly he is both heir to the kingdom uh, and the child of prophecy who is going to be saving humanity against the great evil. Um, and it turns out he's a great leader and he's a great fighter and all the rest of it. He is set up as being this absolute, perfect, tropish hero. And George R. R. Martin has clearly deliberately done that so that when John gets this revelation, it just makes him look this ideal and he will at some way subvert that as a as a really important um part of his narrative now i don't think the showrunners went down that route really they were just using it as a as a plot point for oh so john is also a targaryen surprise uh, and therefore that impacts on relationships and the like uh, but george R. R. martin will be using that as an important part of uh, his 
a sort of a attempt to subvert the, the fantasy tropes that have been there throughout so much of fantasy fiction in the latter part of the 20th century, early 21st century. So I think it's going to be more in the, show, in the books than it is in the show, to be honest. Uh, Lady Marmalade says, always amazing thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, got a couple more uh, questions from uh, my patrons. Um, and I think, so I think we're probably going to go on for about 10, 15 minutes more. Um, this is the time to drop any more questions into the chat. I will try and get to as many of them as I possibly can. Uh, Liana's Lament says, what is your opinion of the fan bashing that has been going on from other fans and even the actors against fans that did not enjoy the season? Um, I and many I know have personally been verbally, verbally bullied online for politely voicing my opinion, actually shocked by it all. What's your view? Have you seen anything like it or is it just a phenomenon of Game of Thrones? Yeah, I, um, uh, I have seen this the 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 amount of um anger within the game of thrones community that has come out over the last few weeks has i i found shocking i i i have seen it um being directed at content creators um some at me uh, other people have had a huge amount more and and a lot more violent um and I've seen it go the other way as well, and I've seen it between fans and the actors. And uh, it's there's yes, uh, this is as we were talking about at the beginning of this stream. Um, there is a degree of shock about what happened in this season, and that has set forth quite a lot of anger and hatred. I haven't personally seen it before this is the first fandom that i've been this involved in before so i kind haven't got any other particular frame of reference but um suffice it to say that yes it's horrific uh, and it it's, uh, it's deeply saddened me that something that should be a unifying force coming around coalescing around something that we all love and we all enjoy talking about that that could actually lead to um people feeling as if they've been bullied um, or being abused in some way uh, just for their thoughts about a TV show. That's absolutely horrific and wrong. Uh, what I will just say, I don't want to labour this point particularly, this channel I've always been very clear, there is no place for that here at all. Um, I will never belittle anybody for their views about the show. Um, I, I value other people's views. Um, my moderators will always immediately stamp down on anything like that in the chat. Um, so I, I take this very seriously that this is always going to be a safe space for opinions. I will not always agree with everyone's opinions because then uh, they'd be really boring. But uh, I think particularly in today's climate out in the world, we have to learn how to disagree in a way that doesn't lead to anger and violence. And uh, if we can model that in some way here, then I will be consider that a, a, a small part in trying to make the world a better place. So uh, yeah, perhaps it's part of the manifesto. Let's, let's learn to agree to disagree sometimes and do it in a way that is not um, uh, angry. Um, thank you, uh, Leanna's learned for that. Um, uh, Kaylee B, do you think that the musical character Marillion could be named after the band Marillion as their name. This is a character in the books for those who are wondering. Uh, he does say so vaguely appears in the show, but not as important. Um, as their name was originally Silmarillion, but they changed it for fear of being sued. Could this be George R. R. Martin giving a nod to Tolkien, or is it just a coincidence? So he did actually talk about this ages ago. Um, he uh, he said that the character Marillion was not named after the band Marillion. He'd not heard of them, um, it would appear. Uh, so um, why he's not a fan of 90s soft rock, I, I do not know, but um, he, he wasn't doing it after that. I think there probably was a little nod to the Silmarillion, um, uh, it, but uh, no, it's just a, it's a good name. Um, 
let's go to the chat. Um, da, 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 what have we got? Um, Percy Angles says, uh, have you addressed why John and Tyrion were not simply executed other than as a plot device? Uh, thanks for the therapy. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, in terms of why they weren't simply executed, I think it's, well, the way that they kind of set it up on the show was that this was a standoff that they should have, um, that they wanted to. This is why the Dothraki kind of disappeared because that, that would have made it very obvious. They should have just been, no one gets in our way, we're going to kill the person who killed um, Daenerys. But the way they set it up on the show was that the, the northern forces were outside the city, the Unsullied and the Dothraki had control of the city and they had control of the prisoners and the Unsullied would have known, Grey Worm would have known that if he just killed them that uh, then the rest of the Seven Kingdoms would just come in and turf them out and kill them. So his only real hope was to try and broker some kind of arrangement. He didn't want to let John go off scot-free um, but uh, he also uh, he had to be aware of the, the situation that they were in. So that was the way that they kind of set it up, I think. Um, it, the Tyrion surviving, I kind of understood more than John surviving because the Dothraki should have just been uh, killing him on sight, to be honest. Um, okay, let's uh, probably about five more minutes. Um, just quickly dip into the chat. Um, uh, so Anu Start says, I love that this channel is focused on law and interpretation. Definitely a pleasant way for me to stay interested in the season without all the unnecessary vitriol. So yeah, actually, this gives me a chance to go back to last Thursday. Somebody asked me uh, what I thought of the season as a whole, and I just started talking about it. And at that point, my internet went down. Uh, and so I, uh, I my little um, explanation of, of, of what I thought uh, never got broadcast. But one thing I would want to say again, what this channel is, is an explanatory channel. Um, and it's a discussion channel. Um, uh, it's not a critique channel. And I think that this, what this means is, it sounds like it's quite a nuance, but um, I'm not ever going to be doing uh, marks out of 10 for a, an episode of a show or, or, or trying to pick holes in something. That's just not what I'm about. I'm about uh, discussing and enjoying and giving a little bit of lore and background to something that I enjoy. If I ever really stop liking something, then I'm just not going to make videos about it, to be honest. Uh, I'd rather do that than... Uh, make videos where I'm just harping on about how bad something is. So it's an explanatory channel, not a critique channel. Is something that I uh, said last week, but um, uh, didn't actually go out. Um, Top Shelf Fandom. Hi, uh, good to see you, Justin. Um, uh, for those who don't know, Top Shelf Fandom uh, is uh, Justin Thomas, who I have collabed with uh, a few times on... Uh, Westworld, and I'm sure I will be uh, again with Westworld Season 3, and he also does a lot of excellent audio editing for me. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, have a word with him if you're interested in any of that. Uh, he rises via merit, and the birthright reveal is a validation that pushes him from a reluctant leader who leads because he's capable, so it's unbearable when the mantle is forced regardless of merit. Yeah, I think this is talking about John. So, yeah, it's the, the one of the things about John which does show, shine through is the fact that he does not ever seek power. It is thrust upon him uh, and people are trying to make him something. So we were almost being set up to expect John to be um, uh, made king. And so perhaps, again, if we're being charitable to the, to the show, we would say that perhaps this is how they are trying to subvert the John uh, being the perfect hero trope is by him not becoming um uh, do, do, let's have a quick check through so see that i can find so any other uh queen victoria nyc says the dothraki follow the strong and whoever kills their carl becomes the new carl so if anything killing danny would logically make john the new leader of the dothraki yes yeah, so and in the normal course of events yes 
uh, you're right that they followed the strongest and if somebody kills a cull, then they follow a new cull. But what Daenerys did when she gained that huge Kalasar over in Essos was she very deliberately and explicitly said to them, you are now all my blood riders. And they accepted, they cheered, they waved their swords in the air. And by doing that, the blood riders, normally there's only like three or so of them, and they had uh, a sacred duty to the Carl that if the Carl uh, was killed, they wouldn't just immediately go off and follow somebody else. They would then hunt down and kill or die in trying the person who killed their Carl. That was what their job was. Uh, and they had to escort uh, the police to the uh, to base uh, But that was what it was. So as all of the, the Dothraki were her uh, blood riders, they should have all been trying to kill John, which is why I think they didn't show them in the second half of the episode, because it would have been a bit obvious uh, that it didn't quite work. Um, uh, Azora Lowe, <laughs> good name, uh, John stuck his aunt with the pointy end and then stuck a knife in her heart, the end. Westworld content, Robert. Uh, yeah, Westworld content will will come. There was a bit, there was the teaser trailer which came out uh, for Westworld season three, which was excellent, had a real Blade Runner feel to it, which I loved, with Aaron Paul, who was uh, from Breaking Bad, he's going to be some new major character coming in. Um, I will start my coverage of Westworld season three when the first proper trailer appears. Um, that was really a teaser trailer rather than a proper trailer. But when when the real thing happened, they're still filming at the moment, so I'm not expecting it for another few months. But when that does happen, I will start breaking down that uh, the, the trailers and we'll go from there on, on Westworld season three. I'm expecting it to land sometime around January of next year. Maybe they'll get it out a little bit earlier, but um, that's roughly where we're at. Um, do, do, do. Desmond Brown says, the whole thing would have worked if they at least let John decide to give up the throne after he created a council. Um, yeah, it could have done that, um, but the, the issue was with the Unsullied and Grey Worm. Grey Worm was not going to allow him king um and um uh, so that was that was where that is um mm -mm. so cara w says sansa should marry then you and improved robin aaron yeah he uh robin aaron did a little bit of a neville longbottom on us didn't he um he changed quite a lot over the course of uh, a, a season or two um, Donna Daly says, uh, slightly been bothering me. Why didn't John deny that he killed Danny? No one saw him do it. Drogon scarpered with the body. Um, I think it's, it's coming back to the honourable thing. Um, we didn't actually see what happened next. We, we just had to assume what happened next. Um, but, um, the, the, he is... In Ned Stark's son, perhaps not biologically, but in terms of character, and so he would have owned up to what he did. Um, and that is um, perhaps the tragedy of him. There is, and, and maybe, maybe this is a video somewhere, but there is a, a mirroring in some way of John and Jamie here, in that Jamie killed Daenerys' father because he was going to kill lots of people, and John killed Daenerys because she was going to kill lots of people. Uh, so that there was a definite echoing going on there, and for both of them it was this, um, uh, they accepted it and faced up to the, the consequences of what happened. Jamie didn't having killed the king, run away or anything like that. He sat there and waited to see who was going to turn up. And similarly with John, I think that what was going, what probably happened was that he just sat there and waited to see who was going to turn up. Uh, uh, Scholistic says, thanks for everything. Thank you. Um, Sue W says, considering Euron has Dragonbinder and his brother has a vision of him on the throne, don't you think the battle will be with the Ironborn? Yeah, so I think it's entirely possible that um, so Dragonbinder, for those who don't know, 
is a magical horn that allegedly can control dragons. That is now currently with uh, Viserion, another uh, book-only character, um, uh, and Euron has dispatched him to go off and get a, a dragon or three and Daenerys and bring them back. Now, that plan is not going to work uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but I think actually what's going to happen with Dragonbinder is that Danny is going to end up with it because she, in that last chapter, which I've already talked about, that last chance, chapter of Dance with Dragons, she even thinks that, oh, uh, in, the, in the olden days, the Valyrians used to control their dragons with magical horns because she couldn't control Drogon and she's trying to work out how to do it. And then just as if by magic, uh, coming towards her at that time is a magical dragon controlling horn. So I think it will end up with her and she will be using this to control Drogon in some way. Um, that's where I see that going. I do think that um, Euron may well turn out to be the Saruman type figure in terms of the scouring of the Shire. So I think that rather than this just being... Uh, Queen Cersei having sat in King's Landing all this time, um, finally having to be pushed out. I think that King's Landing will have a few different people uh, in charge of it. And I think that Euron is going to grow in strength until he has to be finally defeated. And I think that he, uh, with Cersei, uh, will probably, and I think that they will team up in the books as well, I think that they will end up uh, there at the end, after Fagon, Aegon has been dealt with and Danny's gone north. Um, okay, I think that's I think that's it in terms of super chats. Uh, oh, Chrissy, uh, sorry, one of my moderators, Chrissy, is saying um, I missed a super chat uh, from Joshua Modi. Do you believe John was manipulated by Tyrion at the behest of Bran? Um, I'm not sure the context of that. So uh, in terms of Tyrion manipulating Jon to do, to kill Danny, well, yeah, I think Tyrion tried to persuade and did persuade Jon. Uh, thanks, Chrissy, by the way, for pointing out the super chat. Um, did persuade Jon to kill Daenerys. I think that's what... Um, a clear implication was of of what that conversation was. So he was doing that. Was that at the behest of Bran? I don't think it was Bran's telling uh, Tyrion to do that. I think, though, that um, Bran did, again, this is spoiling my Bran, King Bran video that is going to come out at some point in the next couple of days, but I think what... Um, Bran did do was set in train all the events that happened. So, for example, he, um, and we didn't think about this huge amounts at the time, but he was the one who kept Jamie uh, alive. He could have, Daenerys could have killed him on the spot for killing her father and probably would have done, but for Sansa saying that she supported him uh, because of what Brienne said. But if Bran had said, oh, by the way, Jamie pushed me out of a window when I was a child, then I do not think that Sansa would have allowed Jamie to live. So uh, that meant that Jamie survived. It wasn't because he was going to play a really important role in the fight to come. He didn't play a really important role in the fight to come. Yeah, he did his bit, but he wasn't that important. The reason why he had to survive was because he had to go down south. He had to get captured so that Tyrion could then free him. That act of freeing Jaime was the thing that got J uh, Tyrion put into prison. And then the two things that Tyrion did while he was in prison were the two things that allowed Bran to become king. Number one was he persuaded Jon to kill Daenerys. And number two was that he went to the, he thought about what would a good king be and decided it would be Bran. So, that's what was going on there. Was it manipulation? Perhaps a little bit Darren Brownie, if you know Darren Brown, uh, but I don't think it was like a, a, a him using his magic to um, uh, to 
manipulate him in some way. Uh, okay, guys, I think that is it. Um, what I always say at this stage is that uh, I cannot do this without my patrons. Uh, this is why I prioritise answering their questions. Um, th their support allows me to be making more videos and all of the exciting plans I've got going forward be covering even more stuff. That is only possible because of the support of my patrons. So patrons, thank you. I, I, I can't really express my thanks enough, but thank you so much. Um, so if you're at all interested in supporting the channel, becoming a patron, um, and uh, if you want access to some of the exclusive uh, stuff that I produce for my patrons, things like uh, my readings from the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter, um, do please consider becoming a patron. There will be a link, if you're watching this later, appearing somewhere up here. If you're at all interested in my second channel, which is uh, The Well Told Tale, the one I was talking about earlier where I'm just doing audio narrations of the finest science fiction stories and fantasy stories ever written. If you're watching later, there will at some point be a little icon appearing here. You can click on that. Guys, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic chat, uh, some great questions. Um, and thank you again to my moderators. And I will see you for the last of my um, uh, Sunday live streams for season eight. Uh, we're going to be signing off. I've got a Kyle Azora Hype as a special guest for that. So I shall see you on Sunday uh, for the last one of that series. Take care, everyone. See you soon.